Okay, I'm going to loosen the belt. First, you loosen the tension on the idler pulley. The actual adjustment is here. In order to loosen it, we want the pulley to drop down. Take it in this direction here. And as it drops down, we put slack in the belt. And now you can see that there's some slack there. Take a little bit more. Could have used our air ratchet on this. It might have sped things up a bit. So the idea is to get the serpentine belt off, which we should be able to do at this point. And there it is. Got a diagram on the core support for putting this back in place if we forget how to route it. You want to remember that if that decal is still in place, you can use that as a guideline. We replaced the serpentine belt a while back. Again, the idea here is to make sure the cooling system is in top shape. And that includes the drive belts and the water pump. Water pumps tend to be a weak area on the 4 liter engine. With access to the water pump right now, we're really smart to just replace it. We're going to remove the fan and fan clutch and we're going to, as a matter of course, change out the water pump even though there's no perceptible play here. It has a lot of miles on it and uh, it's just a safety precaution. We'll call it insurance. We want to break the nuts loose so we'll hold this uh, steady. We found it safer to use this larger pry bar to support this while we loosen the nuts. The nuts are now uh, finger tight. Watch the fan blades when you're working around them. They can be sharp. They can cut your hand readily. You notice I'm wearing rubber nitrile gloves and even at that wouldn't say that I'm totally protected from the fan. So be cautious with the fan. Wear protective gloves when you're doing this kind of work. That's three. These have factory Loctite on them. They've never been removed. This is the last nut. You can now slide the fan clutch off the studs. Rock it slightly. And there it goes. That's our fan and fan clutch assembly. The studs remain in place. To remove the water pump, we'll begin by removing the water pump pulley. In some applications, you'd have the viscous coupler and the fan outboard of this, but in this particular application with the fan offset, as the 4 liter in the Cherokee does, all we have is a pulley on the water pump. Watch the air conditioning condenser when you do this. Don't damage the condenser fins. I've gone to a 3 8 ratchet with an impact deep set socket. We have more room now between the condenser and the ratchet, so this is a safer approach. We're going to take a few minutes here and change out the water pump. This water pump's been on this engine for 140,000 miles. We'll go ahead and change the pump since we have access to it. If we needed to change the thermostat, which has been done recently, this is the thermostat housing and the thermostat is inside this housing. This is accessed very readily with the removal of these bolts and the thermostat fits inside this housing. In any case, let's go ahead and replace the water pump. We'll begin by removing the two bolts that support the bracket for the power steering pump. I could use air tools for this, but take two seconds this way. We'll go ahead and use a ratchet and socket. Again, if you're on flat rate, you might want to use air tools for this. If you find you don't have enough clearance because of the tight spacing of the power steering pump and bracketry to the water pump, you can loosen the power steering pump from the intake manifold. We're going to go ahead and loosen the three bolts that attach the bracket to the intake manifold. You can access those through the holes in the pulley. And the idea here is just to loosen these bolts a few turns to free up the bracket. So we have enough room to pull the water pump out. You can see that there's a bit of clearance there now. At this point we have four water pump bolts. We'll go ahead and, and detach this hose first. Pull your clamp. This is from the hose. Try to preserve these clamps if you intend to reuse them, especially if you overstretch them. Obviously they won't have the spring tension. To be able to reuse them you'll have to replace the clamp. We'd like to reuse it in this case. We're going to remove the hose because this fitting, this elbow, has to be removed from the water pump and installed on the new pump. Very carefully push on the end of the hose, break the connection loose without damaging the hose. We're going to try to reuse this to be sensible about 
how we get it off the tube. And there you go, the hose is loose and out of the way. And now we'll remove the water pump and this is straightforward. There are four bolts supporting the pump. That one came loose readily. While we're on the subject of pumps, there are aftermarket pumps available, performance pumps. In consulting uh, Griffin for this project, we decided it would be smart to just use an original equipment replacement pump so that we can make sure that we're testing the radiator without any additional upgrades. You want to know the radiator performance by itself. So again, you could use air tools. You're working in a shop on flat rate, especially for the removal of parts. I highly recommend the use of air tools properly. Have a catch basin underneath the water pump. When the water pump is removed from the engine block, there may be a spillage of coolant. This bolt showing a bit of rust. We'll wire brush that and inspect it before we install it again. That's not unusual for the bolt in that position. We'll discuss sealants that we can put on the bolts. It'll prevent coolant from wicking out the bolts and also provide some sort of a rust barrier so the hardware does not become rusted, corroded, and go away over time. It's three bolts, one to go. Again, protect the air conditioning condenser. It's right back in here, out of the way safely. Don't stick any tools into it or damage it in any way. All four bolts are removed now. The only thing holding this in place is the gasket, gasket sealant. And so some very light prying with just a screwdriver should remove the pump from the engine block. Again, don't pry against aluminum. And slide the pump out to clear the bracket. We have the lower radiator hose still attached, so there's a little bit of a clearance issue with that. And there's the water pump. You'll want to clean the old gasket material off the face of the block. Try to keep this out of the engine block. A good idea here would be to place a rag in here to act as a barrier so the gasket material doesn't end up in the block. And scrape off the old gasket material. Scrape it. Don't gouge the block. You're just trying to remove gasket material here, not scrape the block. So be careful and remove that. If it's really scaled on, you might want to use a wire brush to do this on a drill motor. Let's start with a scraper and see how that does. An alternative here is a drill motor with a wire brush on it. Notice that I pack the front end of the engine with rags so that I don't get any debris inside the cooling system. You don't want that floating around in there and clogging up the cooling, especially your brand new radiator. After 20 minutes of working a scraper and a wire brush on a drill motor, this is spotlessly clean and there's no debris inside the engine cooling system. So we're ready to apply sealant to a new gasket, clean up the threads on the bolts, and install the new water pump. A few comments about the new water pump. Make sure that the direction of rotation of the impeller is the same between the new and the original water pump. Make sure that the two bolts that support the power steering have their brackets, threaded brackets in place and we're going to transfer the elbow for the heater hose from the old pump over to the new one. We'll use Teflon sealant on that and make note of the position of the lower radiator hose. Use a quality water pump again in this case we're using an original equipment replacement pump and the idea here is we want to test the new Griffin radiator without any additional coolant flow from the water pump. Gasket sealants are important. What I do is use uh, Permatex thread sealant on the threads of pipe fittings and even the threads of the bolts that hold the water pump to the engine block. I use gasket cinch on the gasket for the water pump because it has a great ability to tack a gasket onto metal and will hold that gasket in place as I set the pump into position. So again, I use Teflon sealant on the bolts and make sure that I don't have sealant on the end of the bolts that will end up in the cooling system and I use that same Teflon sealant on pipe fittings. We'll now place the water pump into position. This elbow pipe is an exact match for fit with the original. I slide the pump underneath the bracket. Make sure the gasket stays in place and bring the pump right up into position. Install the water pump bolts, Teflon sealant on the threads, start them with your fingers, even if you're using air tools, one long bolt, three that are a shorter size, 
Teflon sealant will enable you to remove these bolts later, although I will caution that the Teflon sealant will cause bolts to not necessarily seize, but be really tight coming out, especially after exposure to heat. So we'll get all of our bolts in position. You can look around the outside of the water pump to make sure that you have the gasket in position still. Pump up against the engine block, flush with the engine block, and rock it slightly. Make sure the gasket's in position and seat it. I like to tighten the bolts and cross. I start with the lower bolt and bring it just up to, bring that lower bolt up just to snug. Start all of your bolts by hand. Come up to the top. Don't make it too tight at this point. Use a quality water pump. Mopar is obviously your first choice. They're aftermarket sources. I prefer a new pump. Cherokee pumps newer relatively inexpensive. Use a quality pump though. This is not an easy pump to access. And you don't want to have a fail in the middle of a trail somewhere while you're on a rock climb. Making them snug all the way around. We'll go and cross. Start with the lower one. Snug. Top. Snug. Nine o'clock. Snug. Three o'clock. Snug. Now we'll use a torque wrench and we'll tighten these bolts to 20 foot-pounds. Final torque on these is 22 foot-pounds. I'm not even going to tighten it fully here. I'll bring it up to just below the torque threshold and cross. It's 12 o'clock. That's 6 o'clock. That's 9 o'clock. That's 3 o'clock. Again, 22 foot-pounds is plenty. You don't want to be breaking bolts, especially in the engine block. Still not fully tightened to 22. Bringing it up gradually. It's aluminum housing, 22. That's 22. That's 22, and that's 22. So again, 6 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Let it set for a minute, and we'll retorque them. Okay, I retorqued the water pump bolts, and now I'm tightening the two bolts on the bracket. Always start these by hand. These are aluminum threads and use your torque specs because you don't want to over tighten bolts in aluminum threads. Notice that these are going in by hand and I'll final torque them with the torque wrench. There's a lot of misinformation about how tight to make these bolts. These are going into an aluminum bracket so I'm going to make them 30 and that's plenty. 30 foot-pounds is plenty. If they were going into iron I would consider 35 foot-pounds but going into aluminum 30 gets the job done. So that's 30 foot-pounds on each of those bolts. Plenty tight, no stripped threads. In taking a closer look at the water pump to hose flange, it is more accessible than I originally imagined. So I will put the hose on now before the radiator goes into place, but with the pump already installed. The final step with the water pump installation is to go around the pump, the entire pump. Make sure the gasket is in place and aligned with the edge of the pump. Just a safety precaution. Again, this pump is not that easy to access. If you misalign the gasket or the gasket gets damaged in the process of installing it, you could end up with a problem and find yourself inside the water pump again. So use a mirror if you need to to make sure that your gasket is aligned with the bolt holes as you're installing the pump and then go around the pump afterwards if necessary and check to make sure the gasket is aligned. This gasket happened to go into place very easily but it doesn't always work that way. Again I would emphasize that the gasket cinch made a big difference and that it tacked the gasket onto the back side of the water pump so that when I put it in position without anything in the way I was able to know that the gasket was firmly attached to the water pump. Also gasket cinch is good on disassembly. You'll find that that gasket will not be as difficult to scrape off as the original gasket was. As a final note this pipe is aligned perfectly for the hose. We'll reinstall the hose. I'll probably put a sealant on the inside of that hose. Again, a uh, gasket cinch is good for that. I'll put some gasket cinch around the outside of the tube, slide the hose in place with the clamp here, and reinstall the clamp, and we should have a good sealing joint there. There should be no problem. Setting these bolts to 25 foot-pounds. Plenty tight, 25. I have uh, Loctite 242 on the threads of the bolts. 
two pin spanner wrench will hold the hub of the water pump while I check the torque on these bolts tightening them to 25 foot pounds watch your knuckles this could be a knuckle buster if you're not careful tighten them and cross and then go back around and check them again if you don't have the span tool consider putting the belt on first and tighten these bolts after you have the belt in place don't forget to tighten the bolts between the bracket and the power steering pump. I'm using a torque wrench here. You have three bolts. You're going to do aluminum threads. 25 foot-pounds is plenty. Two upper bolts, one on the bottom. It's 25. Okay, we're ready to put the belt on now. For a quality serpentine drive belt or any other original equipment replacement parts, I turn to Mopar first. This is a Mopar 53010314 replacement serpentine belt for the 4 liter Cherokee engine in this application. This is a 99 model. I highly recommend that you use Mopar parts. One decal that I find especially important is the belt routing decal that you'll find on the fan shroud of this Cherokee. If you're in the middle of nowhere and you need access to how the belt is routed, you throw a belt or whatever, this can be extremely handy. Make sure that this decal remains intact. Keep it in place. You'll use it sometime. This is the routing of the factory serpentine belt on this 1999 Cherokee. 4.0 liter engine. Again, this is a Mopar belt and we turn to Mopar for original equipment replacement parts. The proper tension on this belt is actually set with a tension gauge. I'm going to give you a rule of thumb here and the idea is that if you're on the trail and have to replace this serpentine belt here's one way to do it this is a new belt you should be able to rotate the belt about 90 degrees with resistance if it goes beyond this where you can see the ribs the belt's too loose if you can't get it to rotate to that 90 degree point with resistance with tension then the belt is too tight so I'm going to leave it here for now. I will readjust this belt after it's been in service a short time. My experience has been that these belts will loosen. I've made sure the belt will rotate a quarter turn with quite a bit of tension. And I'm tightening the bolt on the idler. Again, checking the belt. It takes a bit of force to get it to that quarter turn. Another belt tension rule of thumb that works for me with a serpentine belt is to put a good deal of pressure, maybe 40 pounds of pressure, against the side of the belt above the alternator and make sure that that pulley can turn ever so slightly. The reason you want to see that kind of play in the belt is that if you cannot rotate that alternator pulley, you're putting way too much tension on the water pump, on the idler pulley, and on the power steering pump. Obviously, you don't want the belt to slip but on the other hand, you don't want the belt so tight that it knocks out the bearing in the water pump or the power steering pump or in the alternator. We'll check it after it's been in service. You want to check that idler bolt with a torque wrench. 35 foot-pounds is plenty. I'm at 40. That's more than enough and we're good to go. Well, the water pump and a new serpentine belt are installed. The hoses are back on and we're going to install the radiator after that. For radiator hoses, we again turn to Mopar. This is the Mopar replacement hose, the lower hose in this case, for the XJ Cherokee 4 liter engine. As a final footnote, always check your belts and hoses for leaks or a loose belt after installing new parts. We did have to retighten the serpentine drive belt after running the air conditioner on a hot day. A new serpentine belt may require readjustment. Hose clamps may require retorquing. Inspect the system, make sure that the wires are out of harm's way, insulation is away from sharp edges, enjoy your cooling system.
One area of the Jeep Cherokee that could always stand improvement was the cooling system. From the introduction of the 4-liter inline 6 forward, cooling has been a challenge. When the factory substituted the 4-liter inline 6 for the 2.8-liter V6 in 1987, this was the radiator configuration. Tight, small, and right on the margins for cooling this engine. In our 1999 XJ Cherokee, the cooling system with air conditioning is especially challenged. So let's begin with a quick tour and overview of the factory cooling system. To begin, the Jeep Cherokee has a small grill opening. This limits the ambient air crossing over the radiator core. It makes it difficult for the radiator to recover, especially in crawl conditions off highway. The factory engine driven fan has a very small diameter. Of necessity, it's crowded into this small area with a very low overall height of the radiator. The auxiliary electric fan picks up the slack on this side of the radiator and comes on when the engine is at extreme temperatures or the AC is working or you're crawling off pavement. Overall, this is a very busy design and the 4 liter engine is contributing plenty of BTUs and heat that has to be dissipated by a wide and low profile radiator. Because the radiator is so shallow in height, the factory engine driven fan actually hangs below the radiator and core support. This is a tight, busy arrangement, one that leads you to believe that this engine, the 4 liter, was actually a factory conversion into this chassis. The original 2.8 liter V6 sat much further back and allowed for a more centralized location for the engine driven fan. For a variety of reasons, the factory cooling system, which was crowded by design, had a great deal of extra work to do. The mechanical, engine-driven fan is small in diameter. The auxiliary electric fan is crowded into a small section of the radiator. The radiator is broad and not very tall, which has an impact on surface area. These challenges are created by the design of both the body and the chassis of the XJ Cherokee. One of the only ways that cooling can be dramatically improved, and this is a real concern, especially on engines that are built to the 4.5, 4.6, 4.7 stroker design, where you have more horsepower, is to increase the size of the radiator itself and to use materials in the radiator that are more efficient. In this modern era, when a rebuild of the 4 liter engine leads to a 4.5, 4.6, 4.7 stroker and more horsepower, we have more challenges and more load placed upon the cooling system. Remember, horsepower equals BTUs. BTUs are thermal units. When we increase the stroke of the engine and end up with more horsepower output, jumping from 177 or 190 to 230 to 280 horsepower, the original equipment radiator is way beyond its capacity. The combination of air conditioning, trail running at crawl speeds under load, all of these contribute to a cooling system that's constantly taxed. To resolve that issue, we turn to Griffin Radiator. The role of the Griffin radiator, like any other radiator, is to dissipate heat, to take the BTUs from the engine's horsepower and the heat generated and release that from the radiator. The efficiency of a radiator is determined by the airflow across the core and the actual surface area in the core. This is Griffin's newly redesigned radiator for the XJ Cherokee 4 liter or even the 4.5, 4.6, and 4.7 liter stroker motors. In this version, you can see the automatic transmission cooler that uses an elbow that attaches to the lower factory cooling line, while this radiator will also work with the factory engine-driven mechanical fan and the factory auxiliary electric fan. This unit is equipped with Griffin's dual electric fan system that eliminates the need for the engine-driven mechanical fan and fan clutch. Typical of all Griffin radiators is aluminum construction with exceptional welds, seams, and core. The Griffin aluminum radiator core is not only thicker than the stock core, 
The Griffin radiator core offers an exceptional amount of cooling area compared to the stock radiator. Overall, this is a radiator that will easily handle the 230 to 280 horsepower and air conditioning demands of stroker motors. Whether you're upgrading the cooling system of a stock 4 liter with air conditioning that has to operate in high ambient temperatures, desert or summer humidity, or installing a stroker motor with higher BTU demands from the high horsepower output, this Griffin radiator is a solution. This Griffin radiator will enhance the cooling by being able to handle far more BTUs than the original equipment radiator. Not only is this a good looking, quality piece of equipment, it's highly functional.